it's a real pleasure to have uh, my colleagues on here tonight because uh, we have people that have, uh, you know, many years of experience, including my buddy Ray Samuels, who's here tonight, who's a professor emeritus and has worked with me for many years. Uh, Ray, it's 42 years, you said, you're working with Extension? That is correct. That is correct. And uh, Ray is just a pleasure to work with because he has done some pretty extraordinary work with growers throughout Burlington and throughout the state of New Jersey and helps us to put together all of our state and regional meetings and just has a uh, just a wealth of knowledge in the, in the area of uh a vegetable production, uh, and I don't know what we would do without uh, Ray Samuels. Actually, he's retired now, so we are kind of doing without him, but I brought him back because we need him. Um, and we have a new agent, Bill Erickson, in Monmouth County, who is, we're so happy to have him join our team because he's just, a, uh, he's farmed on his own uh, and really done a terrific job, um, really kind of doing maybe some of the toughest farming with horses and Getting yeah, he's out. gone a little beyond farming, man. It's uh, oh, farming cool to the extreme. Let's put it that way. And um, and he's joined us in New Jersey to kind of help us uh, with all of our research and development and uh, outreach. And he, he's specializing in many of the nursery crops and some of the things we're going to be talking about today. And has a background, a well-rounded background at Rutgers University. Um, we also have Rich Weidman who has worked with me for 28 years plus, right, Rich? I guess he's on mute right now, but yeah. We, so Rich is a um, program associate um, and has done a terrific job working with us with growers throughout the entire region, especially in Middlesex County. And Brendan Pearsall, who's a recent graduate of Rutgers um, and has had some experience working on farms throughout the area and running his own business uh, with farming and is just an excellent carpenter, and he's, he's really going to share with some of his ideas as a somewhat beginner farmer and gardener. Um, he's going to have a lot of good questions for us today. And I'd also like to thank Angela Monahan, who's on, who's our head engineer today. She was giving you a talk uh, uh, not too long ago, and Angela is one great young lady. She's uh, helping us out tonight to keep everything straight. She's going to be uh, working with Rich to help forward some of your questions tonight. So make sure you have some good questions tonight. And did I leave out anybody? I think we're ready to go. Okay, let's go here. I'm excited about tonight because we've got a pretty cool topic. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, the season is well underway. Um, a local greenhouse here, a, a high tunnel, actually it's a high tunnel, uh, as you can see. And tomatoes are coming in. Um, we we're going to have ripe tomatoes this week. You can see they're ripening up very quickly. This is a picture I just took today. And uh, the one thing about this that I just want to let you know is wherever we have the most controls of growing tomatoes or other vegetables or fruits, if we can control the amount of moisture, if we can put uh, uh, different types of, of crops on raised beds, if we can keep those clean of weeds, uh, we can produce a very clean product with very minimal pesticide input. Actually, there's been little to no pesticide input in this high tunnel, and part of it is being able to control the environment. So you're going to see, we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, but I do want to let you know that um, uh, the Pick Your Own Farms and many of the farms are open throughout New Jersey. And they're following some pretty strict protocol right now. And look on findjerseyfresh.com slash explore, and you'll come up with uh, farms that are within, you know, 10 miles, 25 miles of your location. And I highly recommend that you support local farmers because it's one of the best things we can all do is to support our local farmers. Um, and another group I'm involved with is the uh, – um, New Jersey Farmers Direct Marketing Association. They also have another website that's great, visitnjfarms.org. Um, so visit those two sites, and it'll be an exciting place for you to be able to get out of the house with your family uh, after we've all been kind of strapped into the house. And the, um, the farmers are using um, very high levels of safety protocol with mask and distancing and making sure all their employees are following strict guidelines. So 
uh, make sure you get out there and visit our local farms and support them, especially in a difficult year like this one. Does anybody else have anything you want to add to that? Okay. So let's talk about keeping plants healthy, and then I'm going to get my colleagues to kind of join as we go along. Um, one of the things that um, uh, is really important, in whether it be vegetable or tree or shrub or whatever it is you're growing, is you've got to make sure that you have the proper amount of sunlight, moisture, light, and oxygen getting to plants. Um, so it's very important that um, we, if we don't have the right conditions, uh, that we provide the right conditions for plants and we select plants that are adapted to the particular conditions that we have. So we're going to be talking about that throughout the whole thing. So it's very important to get oxygen to plants to the, um, and, and, and especially to the root systems because the, the odd thing is if we don't get enough oxygen to plant roots, they're not able to take up water. It sounds odd, but if we flood out areas where we have trees and shrubs and vegetables, um, you're going to see the same injury that you would see whether they're not getting enough water or they're getting too much water. And then fertility, moisture, uh, the proper amount of sunlight is extremely important, especially for vegetables if we want to get adequate production. Uh, many of our warm season vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant, uh, they love to have eight or ten hours of direct sunlight or more. So all these things are critical um, for the health of plants. I know oxygen is a big issue with um, the mulch volcanoes. I know that's something you see where the mulch is piled up six, eight, ten inches deep, and people think you know they're they're helping the plant and protecting the root base, but they're actually smothering it because no oxygen can get down through that. Yes, yeah, so no moisture either. When you get rainfall, and all it absorbs. Right. Okay. And, and Bill, why don't you explain a little bit about a mulch volcano? I know you got some good slides on that, but talk about what a mulch volcano is. Yeah, I've got some slides coming up that'll show some of that, and it's just a common uh, problem that we see in terms of tree planting. Sometimes you see, you know, these nice landscaped areas, you know, either, um, you know, your landscapers in your yard or at a park, for example, and there's just mulch that's piled up the base of the trunk of the tree, and that's called a mulch volcano, and it essentially you're mulching up the stem of the tree and that's not healthy and that's not what we see in nature you know you don't see mulch building up the stem it's meant to cover the roots but the stem should be exposed to the air and so so we'll see some examples of proper versus improper mulching and the effects that can have on plants great thanks bill so one of the things we that nature i think teaches us is look at where plants are adapted in in their natural environment how much uh, light are they getting, how much moisture, um, the microbes in a native environment are just teeming in the soil, um, and there's a lot of beneficial uh, mycorrhizae and other organisms that you'll learn about as you stay with us over the, you know, the next weeks of, um, you know, joining us with uh, Are You Ready to Garden? Uh, there's also a slow recycling of nutrients in nature, which keeps plants growing at the right pace so that they're not more susceptible to disease and insect problems. If we put too much fertilizer on plants, then what happens is that we tend to get too quickly, uh, the, the growth tends to speed up too much, so we can have a higher susceptibility of disease and insect problems. And for instance, I used to work with some of my colleagues um, on turf grass and other ornamental diseases, and if we wanted to actually test diseases, we would give them too much a fertilizer, they would grow too quickly and they would be more susceptible to disease and insect problems. So make sure that you're very judicious on your use of fertilizer within that environment if you want to keep plants healthy. And the more important thing is to keep the, the soil uh, ecology very healthy. So we're keeping beneficial fungi, microbes, uh, especially the plant roots, uh, and beneficial insects happy. So that means we want to try to increase organic matter to at least about 1% if we possibly can in soils. Uh, and we'll talk about a little bit more about that as we go uh, through the uh, series today. Um, but these beneficial microbes like trichoderma and other types of microbes can actually protect many of the plants uh, that we put in the ground so that they can be protected from uh, uh, you know, back to other types of organisms that are actually going to attack the root systems and cause problems. 
So increasing organic matter, how do we do that in a landscape so that we can reduce disease and insect problems uh, and increase the soil um, organic matter and the microbiome so that it's going to be healthy? Well, we can recycle grass clippings back on the lawn and lawn areas. We can top dress lawns and, and even our vegetable gardens with compost. And it's good to create your own compost whenever you can to recycle food waste and, and leaf waste. Um, you want to use compost and mulchers around trees and shrubs. And like Bill said, use just a couple inches, not too much, because you don't have a mulch volcano. We want to increase your organic matter using cover crops in vegetable gardens and other areas as much as possible to recycle nitrogen and increase the amount of beneficial microbes that are in those areas. And there's many materials that we can use. We actually have used um, these, um, as you see, these screens, which are really easy to make with two by fours or two by sixes, just putting some landscape uh, or, or um, uh, fabric on the bottom of those, you know, the steel fabric, and then sorting that compost and then picking out anything that hasn't broke down. And you don't need a, any special um, unit to spread this. You can just use your spin rotary spreader uh, once you've picked out all the large materials and just dry it out a little bit. But that's one way to add organic matter. Uh, to I like that little spreader in the picture. I haven't seen that before. What is yeah, what's, that's really cool. what's that equipment? So that's a commercial spreader that is available. Um, we talk about this in our organic land care program, and they have these out there now. They're they're pretty nifty little gadgets. So you can put compost in there. Uh, it has a little motor on the back of it, and you can put quite a bit in there. And it has a, a self drive motor, so it's not that difficult to push across your lawn areas, but as long as you've got plenty of compost, and the, the trick of that is you only want to put like a quarter of an eighth of an inch of, of uh, compost on your lawn, but it's a great way to add organic matter to establish lawns and do that while the lawn is growing the most aggressively uh, during the course of the year, and that will add organic matter, of course, to those areas. You could do the same thing with your vegetable gardens, but if you really want to improve the health of plants so that they can withstand droughts and actually withstand a lot of um, other issues and be stronger in the landscape, uh, you want to use something, uh, a way to distribute some compost to those areas. If you don't have a lot of compost, just simply uh, use some peat moss in those areas, and that will help you as well. Um, so one comment I wanted to make about sure. these yeah, go ahead. grass clippings. You have to be careful where the grass clippings come from because if they had 2,4-D, and band exactly. and other things applied to them, it only takes microscopic, you know, parts per billion probably to affect certain plants. For example, in the state of Iowa back 100 years ago, we had a major grape growing industry and just the volatilization of herbicides, 2,4-D in particular, wiped out their entire industry and uh, have no longer have any grape industry or very little because of that. So you got to know your source. It's your exactly. Own yeah. And you know what you're treated with. That's one thing. But if somebody gives it to you or you pick them up somewhere, you don't know what it was treated. Right. Now, that's a, Ray, that's an excellent point because that's what I tell people in our classes that you um, want to make sure you know the source of your grass clippings. And if they have been treated with 2,4-D or other broadleaf herbicides, um, you really want to make sure oh, hey, right? <laughs> that they haven't had anything applied to them within the last four to six weeks. So what I tell people to do is if you're not sure of the source of that, wait at least four to six weeks, compost those materials, uh, and let that material um, uh, try to dissipate before you use that. Mm -hmm. And you really don't want to use those around your tomatoes and vegetables. I'm going to take these sunglasses off because the light's going down now. Um, I want to scare you guys a little bit. Um, and th the fact is that we have, uh, in areas where we, they've applied compost that has a little bit more 2,4-D in it, even if, like you're saying, if it has a fraction of that in there, we'll see a major reaction with tomatoes and peppers and especially eggplant uh, and sensitive plants where we'll get all kinds of weird symptoms on those. So you want to make sure that you wait at least four to six weeks after any of those materials are applied. Uh, good point, Ray. Um, so uh, nutrients are extremely, extremely important. So that's why we always recommend taking a soil test from the Rutgers Soils Lab or others' labs. Because what happens is the nutrients themselves um, 
are involved in the physiological processes of the plant, helping to form tissue, but they also serve as uh, helping to form compounds for activators, uh, regulators within the plant. And I kind of, um, uh, you know, relate it to an engine. If an engine's running on all eight cylinders, if it's an eight-cylinder engine, that is, um, then you want to make sure that you have the proper nutrients, the amount of nitrogen that you need, and calcium so that that plant can operate properly. But if you have one of those nutrients in deficiency, you can have problems. And that's really the key to all of this is the fact that you want to have things in balance. So that's why you really have to take a soil test. And those nutrients are also extremely important for the microorganisms in the soil. If we're trying to keep those microorganisms healthy, we've got to have a balance of all those micronutrients. And I know, Bill, you've been working on this a lot with your um, greenhouse and, and uh, work in the lab. So you, you have other insight on this, I would imagine. Yeah, it, it's, you know, part of the whole ecosystem. And we can think about it in similar terms to uh, human nutrition and your gut microflora, where there's so much that's dependent on having healthy probiotics for your digestion that helps you to have energy and to be healthy and less run down. And it makes people and animals less susceptible to disease. And it's this very similar for plants as well to get that nutrition just right get those uh, environmental factors just right, make sure they drink enough water just like we should be drinking enough water, and, and that's when they can be, become more healthy. So it's all part of a larger holistic picture for sure. Exactly, and a lot of times when we're vegetable gardening or we're really just trying to produce, if we don't put back into the soil, whether it be cover crops or other forms of organic, uh, we're headed for problems down the road in terms of uh, disease and insect problems on plants. Um, and one thing I just want to point out that many herbicides and pesticides are chelators. I don't know if you can see that at the bottom. Uh, what that means is they can sometimes tie up some of these nutrients. So you got to be careful uh, on your use of herbicides uh, in general and other types of pesticides like insecticides and what have you. Depending on the product, they can tie up some of those nutrients. So we always talk about right plant, right place, matching sunlight, shade, soil, moisture, conditions for the plant. So that means just putting the right plant where it's going to survive and do well. So for instance, if I've got a really wet area, um, as I do in, in part of my backyard, one of the things that does really well is inkberry, because inkberry just loves that wet condition in there. And there's some wet areas within our neighborhood even that do extremely well with willow oak, uh, and some compacted soils that do well uh, with certain types of pin oaks that will just really do well in those areas. So if you don't have a lot of money to change your conditions, then select the right plants when you're able to replace those plants so that they'll do well. So now we're going to go into all creatures, great and small, in terms of insect problems. And I look back to the good old movie Caddyshack, uh, which is one of my favorites, uh, along with almost any Bill Murray movie. Um, and trying to control problems that occur within the landscape. Um, and we don't go quite as far as Bill Murray did in the, in the movie there. We're trying to control him, but I do like his energy. So let's just put it that way. Um, so groundhogs, um, and we've all had problems with this. Anybody who's gardened, gardened before knows that groundhogs are a big problem. So one of the main symptoms we see if we don't actually see the groundhog is we see these one to one and a half foot or larger foot diameter holes with mounds of dirt around them. And for farmers, these are not just um, problematic in terms of just having these groundhogs eating everything, but if they're driving tractors or you're driving your um, lawnmower in the back and you can actually tip over the mower because these holes are so doggone deep and large, and there are many of them. There are many different exit holes for the groundhog. There's not just one exit hole. That groundhog could have two, three, five, or 10 different exit holes. And they have all kinds of channels underneath the ground so that if it rains hard, uh, they have places to hide out. So it, it's quite a um, uh, architectural design that these groundhogs use to protect themselves. And uh, Brendan, have you experienced any of these in your new garden yet? Do you have groundhogs in your neck of the woods? Uh, I do have a groundhog that lives under my shed. And uh, early on, when I was 
getting my plants in before I got any of my chicken wire or other fencing up. I came out one morning and he was having at my cabbages. And uh, so we, we chased him off and put up chicken wire and fencing, but my, my daughter was very upset and for, for weeks after would go over near the shed and, and yell not nice groundhog at the shed. Well, you know, that's like kind of psychological impact, I think, makes a difference on groundhogs. Just talking to them. And- we had a groundhog getting into our garden one year, and uh, he was getting in and chewing up some Swiss chard, and I, and I had a conversation with him, and I told him, I don't really care much for Swiss chard, so you can have a little bit of that, but if you leave yeah. other things around along, alone, you know, then, then that's okay. And he did for the most part, and I don't know if he understood me or if he just uh, really liked Swiss chard, but I, I let him have that as a peace offering. It seemed to work out. Well, you know, you got to kind of share with the groundhogs. If you share a little bit, maybe they'll listen to you a little bit more. Um, I know when we first uh, situation with groundhogs where, you know, I put fences up and then buried the fences 12 inches, and they still burrowed deeper than that underneath them. You know, if they're persistent, they <laughs> they can be very persistent. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit in a second here, Ray. Oh, okay. But I know that we, uh, even when we, I started gardening with my son when he was very young. Now he's um, uh, he's catching up to me. Uh, but back in the day, uh, when we first started gardening, one of the first things we had to do is really protect our garden from three things. Otherwise, you, you lose your garden from rabbits, from groundhogs, and from deer. Um, and if you don't do that, you could lose your entire garden. And in some areas, squirrels are a big problem. So we're going to talk about that. Um, Really important, so that's why we start off with some of the um, larger animals in our area. And these darn groundhogs, some of them are Olympic. I mean, they could jump over fences. That We had fences that were three foot high, and these fat groundhogs would be going across the lawn, and all of a sudden you see them leaping over this fence. And I'm thinking, how the heck did they leap over that fence? But anyway, uh, so I'm going to give you some tips on how you can prevent problems. So you see these guys, and they can be anywhere from half to three-quarters of an acre or more. They eat everything. Uh, grasses, you see them out there eating your um, uh, everything from the young grass plants coming up to clover to vegetables to any fruit you have out there. Uh, they just love everything. And even the little babies can go into your garden and, and squeeze into your garden, and they can eat most of your crop before you even get a chance to put a fence up. So what I like is the, the local garden here in, in Bordtown Community Garden, they did a really good job of using that um, drainage uh, material that you typically see in like Home Depot or Lowe's or uh, some of the other places. And what they do is they cut a slit in it, put it on top, so when the groundhog tries to climb over the fence, he just slides right back down again. So this is something you can do. And at the base of that fence, you also need to put chicken wire because Many of the rabbits and other smaller animals are going to sneak in the bottom, and you have to make sure that you have overlap where you have the gates. Um, And then around the base, you either have to bury chicken wire or put some uh, pieces of concrete or other materials that they can't dig through. And like Ray says, we've got to get down over a foot or more in the ground and then kind of angle that out, Uh, and we typically will use wire so that they can't chew through it. But this this has been pretty good in some areas of keeping groundhogs out. Um, so it's quite a good technique, um, and they've used it here in this community garden and had really good success. The only place I just talked to two gardeners out there yesterday, they had them coming in through the gate area, and I think part, probably part of that is because they didn't have enough overlap of the fence at the bottom. So you got to make sure that every single bit of the bottom and the top is covered and I would go at least four foot high to keep groundhogs out, but I've seen groundhogs climb, um, and you'd be surprised. They look like they're overweight and out of shape, but they can climb. <laughs> I don't know who you guys have seen, but yeah. also, also very important to make sure you always close the gate. You close the gate, yes, <laughs> and make sure there's no groundhogs hiding in there when you when you uh, close the gate too. Kind of chase them out. But you see at the base of the fence, if you look, there's, there's a concrete slab down here. Um, there's also chicken wire that's at the base to keep out small rabbits and small groundhogs from sneaking in. Um, and you got to do all those things. It's um, Over time, we've learned to keep reinforcing our garden uh, to the point where 
uh, you know, they don't get in anymore. So it's, it's a lot of work, but you just got to learn to do that. And that's the best way to really to control them. So you see here, what we typically do is we'll have an overhang a little bit wire on top, or we'll have uh, the type of tubing that you saw previously on the top. And then we'll bury that uh, wire underneath. And you want to use steel wire, like chicken wire fencing, and go at least a foot, foot and a half down, angle it out at a 45 degree angle. Um, and that'll stop most of your groundhogs. Uh, but it sounds like Ray Samulus has some Olympic groundhogs there that want to climb even below that, right, Ray? Uh, yep, they love to burrow. <laughs> so, rabbits are another problem. Uh, typically, if we have at least two or three foot high fences and we've got small mesh netting um, and we use tree guards, tree guards around our trees and shrubs with hardware cloth with a quarter inch to three quarter inch mesh, um, and we place it about an inch, two inches away from the tree, we can protect uh, a lot of um, animals from basically feeding on the base of the tree because once they've chewed on the base of the tree and they go all the way around and they destroyed all of our vascular tissue, that tree or shrub is gonna die. So we really have to protect those plants. So exclusion is really the only way to keep these guys out. You wanna do that early in the season, right after I, usually even before I plant, I put a fence up for both groundhogs and rabbits. And then squirrels are, can be difficult because they can climb over anything. So what we've done over the years is we will take cages that we built for tomatoes or peppers or other plants, and then we'll actually build a secondary cage over top of it with chicken wire. And we'll just attach that with some quick ties, uh, tie it down into the ground, and that'll keep most of your squirrels out. And if for some reason they're getting in through that, just overlap your chicken wire and do a double chicken wire loop um, of, of on top of your uh, cage, and you can keep most of these guys out. Also, you can use a little capsaicin or dried blood or rappel or mothballs in those areas to kind of prevent them out. Have you guys had any luck with anything? I've yes. seen, uh, I, I've seen, and this is interesting, and, and you have to be a little more uh, interested in, in a bit of a woodworking project, but I actually did see online someone who built what almost looked like a chicken run over his raised bed, like actually framed it out with two by two and then ran, you know, chicken wire or hardware cloth around the entire raised bed, but had hinge doors on it that he oh, could like, cool. unlatch and fold down when he needed to get into his plant. I'm a big fan of the uh, dried blood as a repellent. I've, yeah. you know, used the uh, castor oil extracts. I've used, you name it, uh, different fragrances from, well, actually, that's for mice, but uh, spruce spruce oil and fur needle oil, all these other things. But I find if you apply the dry blood, you know, periodically, particularly after it rains and washes, it gives off a smell that you don't smell, but the animals definitely smell it. And uh, the other beauty of it, it's actually an excellent fertilizer, too. Right. Yeah, it is a good fertilizer. Percent nitrogen. So it's actually high, you know, for an organic fertilizer, 12% nitrogen, you don't get any of that high. I mean, that's pretty high stuff. So well, I that's, also, that's also something that organic growers use. They use dried blood, yep. uh, especially if it's OMRI-approved product. Right. And OMRI, just so for those of you that don't know, it's OMRI stands for Organic Materials Research Institute. So... Well, that's a good idea, Ray. I haven't tried the dried blood. I mean, I've, I've read... One other thing, and I've just tried it this year, and I'm I'm hesitant to say that it was highly successful because I don't really know yet. But I actually purchased a pint container of fox urine, which I have put on little pieces of wood, and it gives off the smell of a predator. And knock on wood, like I said tonight, I'll go back tomorrow morning and find things eaten after the ground. But so far, so good with the fox urine. Uh, folks are asking for a little bit more specifics about what kind of dried blood, and is dried blood the same as bone meal? Or blood yeah, blood? Yeah. yeah, dried blood is, is uh, a completely separate product from the meat industry. Um, and depending on where the sourcing of the dried blood you get, if you're into organic gardening, you would look, want to look for an OMRI approved dried blood product. Um, and bone meal is just that. It's actually what? ground up bones from no, the blood, blood meal. I'm sorry. I, I misread. They asked yeah. about the blood common, meal. Okay. common yeah. ground between the two of them is they're both byproducts of the animal slaughter and exactly. you yep. know, processing yeah. plants. And I can remember farmers telling me that, you know, back in the 1930s and 40s, they would go down to Philadelphia 
and unload ships, and they were strong, 100-pound bags of the bone meal all shipped. Yeah. And, well, you know, I can't even imagine. I'm, I can't even hardly lift 50 pounds, let alone 100. So, it's, so would you, is, uh, is dried blood something you would typically find at, like, a home, in, uh, you know, a home yes. improvement oh, uh, center? Yeah, it or, anywhere. It's everywhere. It's online. It's at Home Depot, um, Ace Hardware, you know, all the different places out there, Lowe's. Usually it's about $4 and some. Or like five pounds or whatever. Yeah, and you just have to remember to reapply it because when it rains, so the rain dissipates. So anyway, there's just some some uh, things you can do. Excuse me, Bill. There's also a question about the chemicals in mothballs, and is that really safe for the garden? I'd probably avoid mothballs um, just in general because um, even though that's a remedy from the old days, there are some pretty noxious chemicals in mothballs without getting into the um, chemical composition of those. So I would use, I would tend to go with the dried blood and some of the other techniques in the capsaicin. And capsaicin is basically just hot peppers. Mm -hmm. And um, even planting herbs around your plants is also does a good job because many of these animals do not like herbs. And when they go into an area where, the, where there's even the smell of herbs, it tends to uh, dissuade them from, from continuing on to eat in that area. Um, so that those are all things you can use. So yeah, you probably want to stay away from the mothballs. Bill, are we are uh, going to have a section on voles and moles, or is that are we uh, that now? Probably. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, here we're going to talk about it a little bit. Okay. Uh, so here we have some cages. We were doing a study years ago using tomato cages, um, and we were actually using what's what's called uh, cattle uh, wire that we use for fields and. It's a nice large opening, it's galvanized wire, but within that framework, you can wrap plastic around it if it gets too cold, or you could wrap uh, other types of fabric around there to protect the plants and to keep animals out of there. But uh, it is one way to keep animals out when you're first starting plants and actually protect plants from the cold. Um, and you can even use chicken wire around that if you wanna keep squirrels out and other animals and overlap the chicken wire so that um, animals are not in there, especially deer eating your plants. So if you're in an area where you've got a real high deer population, we're going to talk about deer in a few minutes, um, you might want to use cages and make sure that you have good hardy stakes on each side of that cage so that the deer can't pull anything out of there and they can't reach in very easily to get your tomatoes or peppers or eggplants. Um, but they tend to work very well. I like cages for tomatoes. And if you get the heavy-duty wire and you make your own cages like this, they're going to last you forever. Uh, we have these at our Earth Center, and we've been using them for many years. So let's talk about deer ecology, uh, one of our favorite subjects. Deer eat anywhere from five to seven pounds or more of forage a day, and they like to eat everything that they uh, encounter, depending on the time of the year. Fruits, nuts, vegetables, uh, landscape plants. And even though we're going to uh, give you a reference for a... Uh, some deer tolerant plants. It's just that if deer get hungry enough and the populations are high enough in areas, they pretty much feed on everything they come to. Uh, because it's like anything, if you get hungry enough, you're going to feed on it and you're going to change your dietary habits. Um, so, and we're seeing a lot more deer in New Jersey. Um, typically, um, anywhere from 10 to 15 deer per square mile is acceptable, uh, somewhat acceptable in many areas. But currently in New Jersey, we're seeing anywhere from 100 to 150 or more deer per square mile in many sections of New Jersey. So that presents a real challenge for gardeners and farmers alike to try to figure out how do they keep those deer from just devastating all the crops they have. Plus, when we build up with very high deer populations, there tends to be a lot of disease and other issues that occur within the deer um, that, that are problematic for them. So. It, it's, you know, we, we do what we can to try to balance all of these things so that we have a good balance within our environment. Because if we have very high deer populations, they're also eating the understory plants in the forest, and they're eating many of our native plants uh, and leaving the invasives like barberry. And then barberry and other plants tend to take over in these areas and become more problematic. Uh, and even mile a minute weed, the, the deer tend to avoid that. And that's why we're seeing mile a minute weed and barberry kind of take over in New Jersey. I'm sure you guys have something, some comments on, on deer. Yeah. 
one thing about the deer is that, you know, and again, it took me a while to understand this and learn it. I always, you know, I had experienced deer working with the farmers at cranberries and blueberries, and, and the tenacity of them is unbelievable. I saw situations where they, they had deer fence with barbed wire on the top, taller than I was, and the deer would stand there, just jump right over it without even running, you know. I mean, they, it's amazing what they can do. That's one thing. And the other thing is what I have three sons, and my middle son lives in Maple Shade. Well, Maple Shade is a town. Okay? It's not in rural area. Well, he just soon discovered after buying his house a year and a half ago that he has two or three deer coming to his yard like once or twice a week. And he's probably surrounded 10 or 15 or 20 miles of suburbia. There's no woods around them. So where are they coming from? I have no idea, but they're they're there. <laughs> well, with suburbia, I think there are a lot of nooks and crannies where they can hide out, and yeah. they have predators, uh, and they don't have hunters to bring the population down. So right. populations now are much higher than they were when the settlers first came to the um, eastern part of the United States. And the reason for that is because of the disappearance of many of the predators. Um, so our populations now are higher than they have ever been. And I know Farm Bureau has been doing studies and doing some very good studies looking at the populations throughout the entire state. Uh, they've been doing flyover data with heat sensitive cameras, and they've been showing that the population is dramatically increasing. And Brenda, do you have any of those in your neck of the woods where you're uh, in suburbia? I'm uh, I'm pretty lucky. I've seen them down uh, around the corner on my street, but I the the neighbors on either side of me have six foot fencing, and uh, I myself have some chain link fencing, and it seems that they haven't discovered me yet. I haven't caught any of them in my garden so far. I'm sure it's a matter of time. Yeah. Yeah. Bill, I was going to ask you what what is the latest status with the uh, the the approach for deer control with birth control. I remember one time Larry Katz, who is our extension director, spearheaded. He did, well, he did some, some very interesting, he did some very interesting studies at Rutgers, but uh, what they found is that, you know, really trying to control, um, uh, you know, using the birth control methods um, wasn't quite doing what they needed it to do. So it wasn't as effective as they wanted it to be. Right. Okay. So, you know, part of it is population control and, you know, figuring out better ways to um, reduce populations, uh, but in a, in a safe manner for everyone. So, yeah, and I, I think a lot of folks, I mean, I, I think people really don't understand how environmentally damaging these populations are as well. I mean, how, how much damage they're doing to the forest understory, how much habitat they're removing for pollinators and native birds. Um, exactly. Forests aren't able to replace themselves. It's it's really doing uh, having quite a negative impact. Well, so what happens, Brendan? You brought up a really good point. If the understory plants are destroyed in those areas, then what happens? We have major erosion of soils, and that erosion and sedimentation goes into streams and lakes and ponds, and th then we've got other environmental problems because not only have we destroyed our understory native plants. Uh, but invasive plants come in in those areas, and then it's not able to support the, the birds and the other wild animals that are in that area. So it can be quite devastating to have these extremely high deer populations. So that's why even um, our staunch environmentalists want to make sure that we balance the populations of the different species um, so that we um, can have native plants in the area and we don't have invasives taking over. Good point. So some management strategies, you know, we use, we, we actually, even at the Earth Center, we protect trees as soon as we plant them. We'll actually put fences up around them uh, immediately to prevent buck rub damage and feeding damage on those plants. Um, and we actually put the fence up the same day that we plant because we've had situations where we'll put in a nice, beautiful tree or shrub, and by the next day, it's already eaten by the deer. So it's good to protect things immediately. Uh, and you can see the damage. Most people are seeing the deer out there feeding, but you can also see the buck rub here on the left, uh, which gives you a good indication. Um, and most of the farmers and, and other uh, people that have large acreages are using um, pretty serious 8 to 10 foot fencing um, with, with heavy duty uh, supported corners. 
Um, you know, that can cost anywhere from 10 to $12 per linear foot to, to install. Um, but you can get away with some, some very inexpensive fencing that is very effective, and we're going to show you that in two seconds here. So uh, we'll provide some tips for that. But this is up at the Snyder Research Farm where they do a lot of great demonstrations as part of our New Jersey Ag Experiment Station. And they do a terrific job up there demonstrating uh, a lot of deer management control. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we need our Ag Experiment Station because they do really good work at all these sites. Here's a, a location uh, near and dear to my heart. It's right in the, uh, about a quarter of a mile away from my house where we walk. And they put in a lot of uh, trees in the back but they put up this quick uh, netting fence for deer. It's about eight foot high, and it actually is working quite well, and it's easy to set up and uh, relatively inexpensive, probably about a tenth of the cost or actually less than a tenth of the cost of the heavy steel fencing. So if municipalities or park systems or you're looking to put something in your backyard relatively inexpensive, you can use this plastic heavy-duty black netting uh, and it really doesn't look that bad. It kind of blends in with the landscape. Um, you just have to install it properly. And it's one of the less expensive ways. But the only way to really keep deer out completely is you got to fence them out. Um, otherwise, they're going to figure out a way to come in and eat almost everything you have if you've got a high population. And there's a direct correlation between the number of deer that you have in the area in terms of what they will feed on. So the higher the population of deer, the correlation is that they will eat a wider variety of plants because they need food to sustain themselves. Some people will use bars of um, deodorant soap hung on trees, or they'll use human hair hung on trees um, and put it anywhere from 15 to 20, 25 feet apart. And, um, you know, the deer in our area are so heavy that if you hang soap up for them, they'll just be out there taking a shower using the soap. So. Uh, I don't know if you guys, have you tried any of this, you guys? And has it worked for you? No, I have not tried it. And uh, I have tried other repellents, too. There are some that are made from, as I think the term is, putricible eggs. Basically, yes. an egg. And, uh, you know, and they're okay if, and they probably work to some degree, if your yard is not situated where you're sitting near where the garden is or where the fence is. If, got a, you know, five-acre property in one corner of it, yeah, you could use that kind of material, and I think it would work. But it has its drawbacks of the smell. So, so basically sulfur dioxide. Probably, I guess. Yeah. Even yeah. worse than that. I Sulfur dioxide I'm familiar with from winemaking. It's noxious, but this is even worse than that. <laughs> so if you took your winemaking out towards the garden area and had it covered, mm -hmm. You might just keep the deer out unless they're preferable to wine. Depends if they like oak age Chardonnay or Cabernet. <laughs> okay. My, so, my, yeah. my mother-in-law swears by Irish spring soap for controlling deer in her flower gardens. And uh, she takes a bar and a potato peeler and goes out and shreds some pieces yeah, of it. And, uh, stretch it out a little more. Yeah, exactly. Hey, I use Irish spring. Maybe that's why the deer <laughs> Well, probably the issue here is it's highly fragrant. See, Brendan, you haven't had any deer nibble on you at this point, have you? No, they leave me alone. <laughs> That's it's why. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, there's something to this. <laughs> so it all sounds good. Um, so anyway, yeah, you can use human hair as well. Um, but any of these techniques, what they found in the research that I have read is that they only work if the deer population is low. Same thing whether you're using control for birds or geese or any other animal. Animals are very smart, and they figure out ways that if they're limited with their food source, um, the, the different weird, you know, repellent calls or, and, and repellent products we use, they get used to them after a while. And later on, it can actually become a beacon where some of these smells, they say, hey, it's, it's dinner time over there at uh, Bill Erickson. Let's go. Yeah. So it really has to do directly with the, the population uh, of the animals as to whether it works or not. So there's also a great resource that uh, our colleague Pete Nietzsche and others put up um, and Pedro Perdomo on landscape plants rated by deer resistance. 
And there's a lot of really great fact sheets on Rutgers uh, New Jersey Ag Experiment Station. So if you're looking for good information um, about plants and other materials, make sure you visit our New Jersey Ag Experiment Station. Um, now, notice we don't say deer proof because um, even these deer resistant plants, it's all relative to the population of deer that you have in the area. So you may uh, deter deer if you've got moderate or low populations, but if the deer are in a high population, they are going to eat whatever they come to. Angela, do you have any questions for us? Because this is a pretty big area. You guys see any questions, Rich Weidman? Yeah, we have most of the questions I think you're answering that um, as you're going along here. There were a lot of deer, kind of deer control kind of questions, animal control questions. Okay. One, one more question I had, which, which someone in the chat did bring up something close. So go, going back to smaller animals, you know, groundhogs, squirrels, chipmunks, other than just the deterrence, what are the options as far as, as trapping? Or someone, uh, someone mentioned sulfur sticks, which I'm not familiar with. But, I mean, what, are there any laws around trapping and relocating? Like, what, what does that look like if you wanted to do a humane trapping? Trapping is a very difficult thing. Let me tell you why. Because, if you, Ray, you can back me up on this, but if you look at the laws, you know, it says, you know, trap the animals, but then what do you do with them? Well, you release them in a safe area. Well, find me a safe area where somebody's going to want you to release groundhogs and other animals um, and is going to accept those animals to be released. However, the so what I would say is call your animal damage control people within the township or whatever. Let them take care of it and figure out where the animals can be relocated to in a safe zone. As a, as a homeowner, I, I would not deal with that because I think it's too difficult as a homeowner to even go down that road of trapping. Um, in some townships, it's easier than others to get the animal damage control person to come out, but I think that's the way to handle it. And especially if you see raccoons out during the day or you see other animals like skunks out during the day, you need to be a little bit careful and call your animal damage control because those animals could potentially have rabies. So you want to let your animal... Uh, control person in the area know uh, that you, you're seeing these animals out in midday. We we saw that not too long ago, and we did call them because we said, hey, you know, we're seeing these animals that are, are typically nocturnal, meaning, meaning they come out at night, uh, and they're getting too close to people. Usually these animals will not get close to people. So if you're finding that they are getting close to people, then you want to call somebody to come out uh, and trap those animals and get them out of the area to make sure that your dog or cat or your your daughter or whatever doesn't get uh, rabies. So, so we, we actually did have someone, uh, Michael, in the Q&A chat uh, said that apparently they recently just read a uh, New Jersey law about this that states you can only release wildlife onto your own property. Oh. So that <laughs> that covers that. Well, yeah, I mean... Those laws are, are very, uh, yeah, well, let's just say that you know, it's best to call the animal control person and yeah. see what they can do um, because it's not an easy problem to solve. Let's put it that way. So for most homeowners, it's, it's going to be tough. So you've got to do the fencing like I talked about today to really keep them out. So let's get into, we, we talked about all creatures great. Now let's talk about all creatures small. Um, insect and disease problems, and we'll get through as much as we can uh, within the next 40 minutes. Um, and then we're coming back for part two in, in uh, like three or four weeks, uh, the whole group again. And uh, we're going to be talking about get into more specifics of some other problems. So uh, just bear with us, and we'll get through as much as we can today. So in integrated pest management, which we're going to talk about, um, in any system where any of my colleagues and I are trying to figure out a problem for a farmer or a gardener, um, we have to first properly identify the problem at hand, what species of plant that problem is on, determine the, determine the severity or the intensity of that problem, whether or not we actually need to control the problem, and then we base the control of that pest or problem on the life cycle of the pest. What time is the best year to control it? because oftentimes people will use a control method, but it's not necessarily the best time of the year to do that. So that's what we really look at in integrated pest management. And that's why our IPM program at Rutgers is so strong in working with farmers throughout the state. 
uh, working with vegetable growers, working with fruit growers, working with nursery growers uh, to make sure that they're limiting their pesticide use and really targeting uh, a low uh, impact pesticide to completely uh, resolve the issue or resolve the issue within means uh, and reduce their unnecessary use of pesticides. And here we see some problems here. Um, you see it's the white grub complex in the middle slide there. And there are many different species of beetles that can actually cause the white grub complex, including June beetles and Japanese beetles and Oriental beetles. And uh, beetles, there's a list. Goes exactly, yeah, there's a long list. And so when you're trying to control these guys, or if you see your lawn dug up, what do you think is digging up that lawn? Anybody know? Anybody want to put in Q&A what they think is digging up the lawn? We can have some participation here from our audience. Birds? Uh, birds can be. That's a good one. Can we give hints or no? Yeah, we can give hints. Go ahead, Ray. Give a hint. Some of the animals smell. Okay. Like skunks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Moles, um, skunks, voles. Also, moles are going to be down there. So if you have a real mole problem and you see a lot of these tunnels out there, you really need to control the grubs first. So if we control the grubs, then we can control some of these other um, animals that are actually digging up our lawn. So uh, one way to look at it is controlling, uh, you know, the Japanese beetle is one of them, one of many. Uh, but this same kind of scenario about the life cycle is important to understand that usually about mid to late June is where the adults come out. Uh, it depends on growing degree days more than it depends on just a calendar. Uh, but when they come out and they produce either Japanese beetles or June beetles or whatever, then they can feed on hundreds of different types of ornamental plants and really wreak havoc. And the best time to control a lot of these guys is in August, because then we got the first instar of the grub. We may put down some systemic materials in, in uh, mid to late June, but that's so that these systemic materials can be taken up through the plant and then give us adequate control in August. But if we're using direct, contract, uh, direct contact or biological materials, we want to put those materials down in August when we're going to have the greatest effect on that first instar of the grub. So that's the best time to do control. Any comments from you guys? One thing that I wanted to mention, Bill, was I used to get questions about products such as Bag of Bug, you know, which... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Good, well, good one. Yeah, is a material, it uses a material called an insect pheromone, basically right. sex attractant, okay? So the deal was that you could catch a whole bag of insects and you felt quite satisfied. You'd say, wow, look at all these accords. What they're not telling you is the fact that sex attractions sometimes can go miles. So you're drawing insects from a half a mile around you. So you're right. actually attracting them to your property instead of controlling them. So the best place to put it is not on your property. But about the two properties down. Yeah, you're, you're helping out your neighbors. You're right. There you go. Exactly. Because yeah. that kind of help, I, I'm glad I don't have you as a neighbor. Yeah. Now, Ray, weren't you trying to use some of that pheromone material yourself back when you were about 18 or 19? Yeah. Well, I, I, I do have a quick story about that. I did a television <laughs> show one time with pheromones with Kathy Gandolfo for Channel 6, I think, in Philadelphia. And we were out at the Brunswick County College, and I had pheromones in bag in a, a uh, aluminized, plasticized, sealed container. So we were doing, you know, a show about this, the, the traps, you know. Well, before we even got started, she called the interview off because we got, were so bombarded by beetles, like in her face and her hair and her eyes. Yikes. That was with, without even opening the containers. That was just the product coming through the sealed plastic and sealed metal container. So wow, that's incredible. How powerful they were. <laughs> that was the end of that. She says, I'm not doing that any again. You know? Yeah, I, you know, you're absolutely right, Ray. I don't know of any human being that's had luck with these traps. And if anybody's had luck with them, I guess they can tell us in the question. So end of fights, I know that they're uh, dear to Bill Erickson's heart. Uh, um, a good friend of mine, Basan Baye, was back at Rutgers uh, back when I was in grad school. And he actually re-isolated a lot of these end of fights from grasses that had disappeared because grass seed was improperly stored. And um, it's, it's pretty interesting because at, right at Rutgers University, we have the 
World Class Institute for Turf Grass Science, and it's it's amazing the work that they do at Rutgers uh, in turf grass science. And uh, they were able to re-isolate endophytes and get them back into a lot of different seed types, especially um, rye grasses and the fescues. And by doing that, they provided protection from many insects and even some diseases that we see uh, by putting them in seed. And as long as you use fresh seed that contains endophytes, it's going to give you natural protection against many of the surface feeding insects like bill bugs and chinch bugs and sodweb worm and those kind of things. So that can be a natural way just by going out and looking for grasses that have endophytes in them uh, to give you natural protection so you don't even need to turn to insecticides in your uh, turf grass. Uh, Bill, I'm sure you got something to say on there because you're the turf, turf guy. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting area and, you know, it's a natural symbiosis between the beneficial fungus or beneficial bacteria as well and the plant and the microorganism is getting sugars from the plant and the plant is getting these defensive properties. And uh, some of the research that I'm actually working on right now, we actually went into the pine barrens and isolated beneficial endophytes from native grasses growing in the pine barrens. So drought stress, sandy, low fertility soils, and then we were able to use them, use those bacteria that we found in the pine barrens in grasses, uh, we did some work with tomatoes, and we're finding that they're able to improve the growth and stress tolerance of these other plants as well. And they're just native um, organisms that were living in the roots of, of plants in the pine barrens. And so we're trying to develop biofertilizers and make that something that can become available to farmers. So you have to initiate these endophytes right at the seed stage or early stages? We're um, experimenting. We so we've, in the greenhouse, we've been watering them in as an inoculant. So you can do a seed inoculant, um, but now we're experimenting with uh, also soil drenching or foliar spray. Sometimes they can get into the leaves and move into the roots as well. Um, oh, that's so, cool. That's really neat. Yeah, you can tell I'm an early scientist because I love all this stuff. That is really cool. Um, and, you know, it was kind of interesting that some of the colleagues back when I was in school really started to get into this with, with the Turf Grass Center. Um, and I just thought it was fascinating work. We were working with trichodermis too for beneficial biological control. We'll talk about those later. So there are grasses that have more endophytes than others. And if you go to our website, we have a listing of grasses uh, and the amount of endophytes that some will typically contain. But it'll either say myco advantage or contains a fungus that's beneficial and provides uh, biological control on the bag of the seed. Um, so you want to pur purchase fresh seed too, because if the seed is old, the endophytes tend to die out. But these, what you see here in this slide, this is an old slide from back when I was in graduate school. Where we were actually staining the mycelium of uh, the different endophytes as they were growing through the sheath tissue. And most of the endophytes that we see are growing from the seed up through the sheath tissue, but we don't see too many of them down in the root system for a lot of the grasses. Um, that is different, though, for different plants. So cultural strategies for insects across the board when it comes to turf grass, where you can, uh, you can really cut back on a lot of pesticides, is maintain sufficient soil moisture because we get many of the beneficial fungi that will actually help to control some of those insects that become problematic. We want to avoid thatch buildup, um, and that's that area of, of un, uh, you know, broken down uh, roots and rhizomes and other materials and some dead materials, and, and the insects can hide out in those areas. And we also want to use endophyte-enhanced varieties whenever possible to control insect problems. And that'll give us a lot of control problems within turf grass without ever reaching for an insecticide. Um, so integrated pest management is using all the things we're talking about today um, using sustainable approaches, using technology and management, which we're going to talk about more today, um, uh, looking at what are the risks to the environment, economic uh, issues. Uh, but we want to effectively control the problem that we have at hand no matter what. And the idea is not to annihilate the entire uh, species that we're trying to control. It's just to get those species below a threshold level so that we don't have a specific problem anymore and the plant or the root system can outgrow that pest problem. Because our goal is not to annihilate all forms of life, but it's to try to have a, a balance between the good and the bad organisms within our system so that we can have adequate production. 
So we use all the tools in our shed, as we say, using good genetics, using good placement of plants in the right place, um, improving our soils, which we'll talk about over the next couple of weeks, uh, good management techniques, and then education. Uh, and one thing I'd just like to allude to there, of anyone who's not been involved in the Master Gardener Program or the Are You Ready to Farm Program or other programs that we sponsor, just contact us at Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Each county has a, a great Master Gardener Program that you can be get involved in. Um, so what we really look at, like when, when Bill and I and Ray and others go out to, to do diagnostics, we recommend that growers plant resistant varieties whenever possible that they inspect plants coming in. You wanna do the same thing as a gardener. Look on the underside of leaves, make sure that plants that you're planting in the garden don't already have aphids or white flies on them or other problems. Make sure you practice crop rotation, which we'll talk about. Uh, make sure you have good sanitation in your garden uh, and make sure you're not overdoing it with fertilizer or what, make sure you're watering properly. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So crop rotation just means not growing plants in the same family in the same spot two years in a row. And this can go a long way to reduce disease and insect problems. So farmers are very smart. They learned this a long time ago that they need to rotate crops uh, in their fields and they don't wanna plant, uh, for instance, plant, plants in the solanaceous family include tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes. So we never plant those in the same spot two years in a row or if we do, we're very careful about you know, where we're putting them and whether we're using uh, heirloom versus conventional uh, hybrid varieties. But you wanna rotate your crops as much as you possibly can to reduce uh, disease and insect problems. And biological controls, very good. Now, Bill, have you worked with biologicals in the past much? Um, a little bit. Yeah, and I definitely always try to encourage the ones that we want when we see them and to reduce the amount, um, you know, of chemicals that, that could potentially harm them as a byproduct as well. Now, what are your favorite uh, biological controls? I like I like the lady beetles here that we're seeing and especially the um, the larval stages of the lady beetle, which look nothing like them, nothing like the adults. They look like a completely alien creature. Um, yes. they, they'll eat a lot of aphids. Um, the lace wings are really good. Um, yeah, lace wings we, we use a lot of, yep. So these guys can eat a lot of aphids in one day. They're pretty hungry, but the problem with uh, uh, our creature on the right there, the praying mantis, is that he eats everything. Anything that's not smaller than he is, and praying mantises don't seem to even be afraid of people. They just will sit there and look at you. Um, and, you know, they're just out there having a good old time. But, but they don't make the best biological control because they also kill our beneficial insects, too. So, and the one way to keep these beneficials, especially later bird beetles in the area, is you want to have a source of water for them and you want to have an area where they can seek cover, uh, shelter, shade, so that they're not eaten by birds because birds are gonna swoop down and eat all these insects. So they, if they have cover, they'll come out at times of the day um, and they'll help feed on the aphids and the white flies and other insects and they'll do a great job for you. We use them in greenhouses too. We, there's a whole series of different um, biologicals in greenhouses, but they can do a pretty good job of controlling aphids, but you gotta, you gotta put them in there right when you start to have the problem, have banker plants in there because if you let the problem get too intense, it's very hard for the biologicals to keep up with the problem that you have at hand. So using them in a high tunnel with um, some type of mesh cloth or in a greenhouse is very effective. Any questions on that? I was gonna say that, yeah, with the biologicals out in the open fields, it can be a challenge because right. they don't stay where you wanna put them. It's the very same thing when I worked with the cranberry growers. They would pay lots and tens of thousands of dollars to bring the bees in there, and then the bees would go work the wildflowers along the banks of the cranberry bog instead of the cranberries. You know, so right. it depends what they like. They're going to go to their favorite food support, support yeah, supply, similar to the way you said, Bill, with the deer. They're going to they have a pecking order. They yeah. this and that. So they move around a lot more, and that's the challenge with the biologicals in an outdoor environment. Exactly, you know, and we, even for the mile a minute weed, we use some beneficials in there because we're seeing mile a minute weed really moving across the state of New Jersey. So we work together with uh, uh, New Jersey Department of Ag 
uh, in their release program, and they did a terrific job of releasing some beneficials that just strictly target the mile a minute weed. We had very good success, and they were able to overwinter and start to give us adequate control of this very invasive pest. So it's pretty cool the, the work that we do in cooperation with the New Jersey Department of Ag. Bill, uh, what, what kind of shelter would you want to have in your home garden for for these kind of beneficial? Uh, just having larger plants that have uh, canopies on them. You know, even planting uh, large plants, you know, with large leaves that these guys can hide under so that the birds can't see them. You know, whether it be sunflowers or other types of, you know, large plants out there. Anna's hyssop is a good one um, that they'd like to hide out under. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the plants that are really, really cool that these guys love and really attracts a lot of beneficials. Um, before we use any pesticides, we always say to everybody, you know, stop, read the label. Uh, really, really important. You don't want to use a product that's not labeled for the specific crop um, or the problem at hand that you're trying to control. Um, and pesticides can be conventional, synthetic products can be organic-based products. But even with an organic-based product, that you, you know, you don't use any more. You have to follow the label. And just because it's labeled organic doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want with it. You have to follow labels in all cases because that's the law. And botanical products and biological products, horticultural oils, and even soaps, the same thing. You want to read the label um, and make sure you're following that label to the T. That's the law, and you could get in trouble if you don't follow that label. Any comments on that, Ray? Because I know you're a pesticide man. Yeah, I would say that's, you know, a good comment. And also back to the issue that the misconception with some people that organic means you don't use any pesticides. That's 100% incorrect. Right. If people use pesticides, they use different pesticides. And exactly. So clear. typically the pesticides they use are OMRI-approved uh, organic uh, OMRI stands for Organic Materials Research Institute. Institute right, correct. For organic growers, they will select those products. Uh, but even there, they have to be careful. They have to use those products according to the label. Yep. Many of the organic growers that I know that I've worked with, they really try to limit just like any farmer does. Because to be honest with you, whether it's an organic grower or a conventional grower, nobody likes spraying pesticides. We're now out on a joyride spraying pesticides, and it costs us a lot of money. So all of us want to reduce the amount of pesticides we use. We want to have effective controls of whatever the problem is, but we want to use, also use something that's soft on beneficials. So we don't want to hurt the ladybird beetles. We don't want to hurt bees. We don't want to hurt other pollinators and native pollinators that are out there helping us. And farmers are very cognizant of that in New Jersey, and they're very good stewards. Um, so the ones that I work with, you know, use integrated pest management, and they do their darndest to reduce unnecessary pesticide use. But at the same time, you want something, you want to know when to control the, the particular issue, too, because if you put the product down at the wrong time of the year or you put it down ineffectively at the wrong concentration, it could actually have the reverse effect that you want it to. So you really have to read the label. Okay. Um, Brandon, I'm going to let you talk for a few slides here because your slide is next, and you can talk a little bit about row covers. Yeah, um, row covers are are a fantastic mechanical way. If if you really want to avoid using chemicals in your garden, it's a great mechanical uh, you know technique that you can use to protect your plants not only from pests but also from frost and weather. If if you're if you're gardening at the beginning and the end of the season and you're trying to get a, little, a few more weeks either way out of your garden, this row cover, they sell it in a lot of different weights, and you can, you can put that on to protect from frost damage. But what it's really great for, uh, for things like I think someone mentioned squash vine borer in the comments, um, Colorado potato beetle, the cabbage moths, um, this for plants that don't necessarily need to be pollinated, uh, you can cover them up the entire season. Rain and sun can get right through. Your plant can still grow, but the, the insect has a hard time getting to it and finding it. Now, with something like squash that eventually needs to be pollinated, you're going to need to make sure to take that, out, take that cover off during the day. But uh, the, the, the squash vine borer, what lays the eggs, is mostly active at night. So as long as you're covering that up at night, you can generally keep your squash plant safe. Yeah, where did you get your row cover? Where did you order it from? 
Uh, Johnny Select Seeds. Um, okay. they're, they're, they tend to be my go-to for most gardening things, and they sell, uh, I think there's probably four or five different weights of row cover, all the way from really light, you know, insect pest exclusion cover, all the way up to really heavy gauge stuff that if, if you're trying to, like, overwinter, you know, and keep growing something like kale or collards throughout the winter, you can add, add some extra degrees and in insulation to your plant. So here's a picture of your garden, right? Yeah, that's my home garden. Um, and I do have to say, full disclosure, I used row cover for my, uh, for my cabbage and my broccoli and kale. And um, they still, if, if you have little tears in there, the, the cabbage moth will find its way through. So I still found myself in an ongoing battle picking off caterpillars every day, still having plant damage. Uh, right up until I sprayed BT, uh, which which really took care of the problem. And explain what BT is. So uh, B- BT is it's a it's a um, it's a, a biocontrol. It's a bacteria that uh, it's generally it can be used in organic, and it's a bacteria that you can spray on the plants. And as the caterpillars uh, try to feed on the plant and ingest it, it kills them. But it's, um, it's got a very specific mode of action, which makes it almost entire, entirely harmless to people. So it's really, it, it, it's actually a good illustration of why farmers do spray, because you can try a lot of these mechanical deterrents and cultural deterrents, and sometimes you just have a bad year, and there's more bugs than you can handle, so you, you try to find the thing that's going to do the least amount of harm and uh, allow you to take care of the problem and actually get a harvest. One of the crops that we used to grow for the market was arugula, and arugula can get really destroyed by flea beetles, and so, you know, greens, your market greens or arugula that has chew holes and it is not very marketable and so we would as soon as we would seed arugula we would cover it with the row cover bury the edges of it so no flea beetles could get in and the only time we would uncover it was to harvest and then it would get covered back up and it would spend its whole life under this cover um, you know and there couldn't be any holes in it or anything because they're so small they'd find their ways in but for for crops like that where there's very little tolerance for for damage um, yeah, it, it's really effective. So, Bill, did you find that that was pretty darn effective? Was it like 90, 100% almost? For you? Yeah. The edges had to be sealed. Sometimes we would dig a little trench and bury all the edges, and there could be no tears in it. There could be, you know, no gaps. And we had to also practice crop rotation so there weren't flea beetles already there because if you put a row cover on when the insect is there, you're just trapping them in there. But, but yeah, they got a nice, very, very effective. Yeah, they would have a nice little protective area to feed in, right? Yep, food, habitat, everything's good in there for them. Wow, that's pretty cool. It's just, it's good to see the two extremes there that you got to really cover them properly. So, uh, a couple things we deal with: tomato leaf blight, uh, is a fungus disease over winters in the soil. Um, you know, many of our, our our plant species, especially the new tomatoes that we grow, or some are resistant to it, or it doesn't necessarily take the, the plants out depending on what the particular uh, blight is that's coming in. But the best way to really control it is to keep the plants healthy, to keep the leaves as dry as possible, um, you know, to keep the plants off the ground, to grow them vertically as much as possible and have good air circulation. Um, and sometimes we end up using a little bit of copper, too, for some of these, these problems. So crop rotation using varieties that have resistance like uh, Mountain Supreme and Celebrity and BHN 589 and many of the new varieties that we grow. Um, ordering at the base of plants in your vegetable garden, making sure you don't get the leaves wet and they stay wet for a long period of time. Staking or caging the plants so that they grow upright and they have good air circulation. Making sure we remove any diseased leaves at the end of the season or if leaves drop off or the worst leaves on the bottom, sometimes we can take off the plant. Uh, and just kind of keep good sanitation measures. And if we have to, we can reach for some fungicides. There are some copper materials that are registered for both conventional and organic farmers that we can use sometimes. So leaf blights don't necessarily mean the end of the world. You're always going to see diseases on many of these crops, or many times you do. So it's just a matter of of taking it easy uh, and taking one step at a time to try to reduce those problems.
Can I mention one thing, Bill? Um, sure. Going back to general cultural controls, and, and this in particular I think is an important one, it, it's something that I think farmers do instinctually, but a lot of home gardeners, it's a mistake I see a lot, and that's improper plant spacing. Um, I think gardeners, because they have such a limited space, they really like to try to smush those. Yes. You know, the seedling's only this big, so I'm going to put them a foot apart. Um, yeah. you know, not realizing how big that's going to be. And, and it's really important to follow those seed packets. When it says, you know, 24 to 36 inches, you know, really follow that. It looks crazy at the beginning that your plants are two feet apart, but right. that is very important for this disease control. It allows that good air circulation when your plants aren't on top of each other. It keeps the leaves from being wet because they have the space to dry out and breathe. And, it, and it's, it's a mistake I see gardeners make all the time. That's, that's a really, really good point. I will have to confess that I was one of those people, too. I always jam things in too much. And my it's, it's such a temptation. Yeah. This year, I finally have added another foot between my tomatoes. So yep. they're spaced nicely now. There are so, so, Ray, Ray were you practicing square foot garden to the letter then? Yeah. yeah. You really wanted a lot to cram as much as you could into a square foot, right? Tomatoes right now are over the top of the stake, so they're six foot stakes. So. Yeah. Well, we found the same thing, you know. Uh, tomatoes that are staked, you know, um, at least two feet apart, yep. sometimes a little more, especially if you're growing heirlooms that are going to get very tall, unless you do a lot of pruning on those. Uh, you got to give them a little bit more space because you want good air circulation. You want the sunlight to come in from the sides so that you can have adequate ripening, adequate photosynthesis for energy production for the plants. Um, and if you keep those plants good and healthy with good air circulation, you're going to have less disease problems. And they'll be able to, to get through some of these leaf spot diseases and still give you adequate production. Another thing yeah. I wanted to mention about disease control with tomatoes or anything, for that matter, with fungicides, it's extremely important that people understand the fact that for the vast majority of them, Fungicides are preventative only. Right. Whereas if you see you have a bad problem, you start spraying, it's too late. It's the same. It's already too late. Yep. You're it's absolutely right. Of, uh, what's it called? Uh, vaccination for measles or for whatever. You know, you don't get a polio vaccination after you already have polio. It's the same thing. No, that's a good point. And they always said that in plant pathology in the many uh, plant pathology courses I had, you know, with many diseases, by the time you see it, it's a little bit late. Mm -hmm. But by taking a, as many cultural, um, doing as many good things as you can culturally to prepare the soil, do proper spacing, plant-resistant varieties, um, you can prevent a lot of these problems from even occurring. Mm -hmm. So, and then choosing varieties, a lot of your seed packets will tell you, especially with tomatoes, whether they have a V, verticillium resistance, or wilt. Um, F for fusarium uh, wilt resistance, nematodes or N, and then T for tobacco mosaic virus. And where I don't know if you remember back when we used to work in the greenhouses when we were younger, they wouldn't let anybody who was smoking come in the greenhouses because they had a chance of actually spreading. Yeah, TMV, right? Exactly. You're so, right. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's pretty bizarre how some of these viruses can survive on these surfaces for so long. And then good old verticillium and, and different types of wilts that it can occur with, with anything in the solanaceous family, whether it be eggplant, uh, tomato, potato. And we have to rotate those crops. If we get verticillium wilt in there, sometimes that'll last in fields anywhere from five to seven to eight years or longer. So we really got to plant varieties that are resistant to it uh, and rotate out as much as possible and make sure that if we've had a problem in those areas that we plant in clean potting mix uh, so that we don't have that problem occurring over again. I don't know if you saw much of that when you were out and about, Ray, when you were visiting farms. Absolutely. I worked with growers, and in certain cases, we even fumigated the ground to control it. And ironically, in at least one case that I remember in particular, was it, it ended up killing the entire field after we fumigated. And what the theory was is that we controlled all the other you know, the antagonistic fungi. Yes. And the disease got worse. It didn't get better, it got worse. We had that in a field of fusarium where we went in and um, somebody had recommended that they use a general fumigant. Fumigant, right. And they controlled the problem temporarily, but like you said, then 
the disease organism came back in and it was worse than it was before right. because there were no biological antagonists in that area to fight it. So that's why that when we talk about balance of soil microbes, it's very important that we have that because just because you eliminate the disease doesn't mean it can't come back in. Nope. Um, so, so viruses too. Sometimes we'll see viruses on plants, um, all kinds of plants, whether it be ornamentals or vegetables, where we'll see this twisting and gnarling. Um, you, you get a similar effect from 2,4-D damage too. Uh, you see it sometimes on plants, on broadleaf plants. But sometimes you'll, you'll see a, a plant here and then there'll be skips and then uh, maybe an aphid or another uh, insect that's spreading the virus lands on a plant on another area. Um, so you have to control the aphids, white flies, and thrips if you're going to control viruses from spreading across your field. But typically what we tend to do is we'll rogue out plants that have the virus because we don't want uh, especially certain viruses that completely shut down tomatoes or strawberries or other plants. We don't want those viruses spreading, so we'll actually just take them completely out of the field, and that's one of the best ways to control it, uh, along with controlling the um, insects that spread the virus because they have sucking mouth parts and, and they actually go in, extract the virus, and in some cases initiate the virus to be active and then uh, implant that virus into surrounding plants and cause more problems in that area. And blossom end rot is really not a disease. What is it, Brendan? A recent graduate from Rutgers. It's a calcium deficiency that's causing exactly. inconsistent watering during fruit set. <laughs> exactly. And it's calcium, but it's also that the, the water hasn't been, uh, moisture hasn't been taken up properly throughout the, the time frame. So you'll see that it'll affect maybe one setting of tomatoes, but then the next grouping of tomatoes that comes out the next production cycle, they're fine because they had enough water, they were taking up enough calcium. Um, so it could be calcium deficiency or it could be that there's uneven moisture throughout the development of the tomato. So why it's called blossom end rot is that the blossom end of that tomato turns leathery dark, and it's not soft, but it's leathery, and it's because of the lack of calcium that that tissue did not develop correctly. And although it's listed in disease categories, it's really not a disease. So just by providing uh, even, equal watering, you can prevent the problem. I think, what Bill, what they term it is a physiological disease, not yes. a pathogen. Yes. And I t tend to think of physiological as not a real disease. But anyway, that's just me. That's my old school, you know. <laughs> We're old school. These guys are new school. <laughs> Good old slugs and snails uh, trying to control those, especially if you have a lot of organic matter out in your fields. Um, you can, and, and especially organic growers have to deal with a lot of slugs and snails because they tend to use straw and other covers, and the slugs and, the, and, and these guys can hide underneath of that and they can become more problematic. And you'll see that they can shred the heck out of plants. And they, can, they leave this little silvery trail uh, of mess behind them. It's, it's almost like getting slimed. That's the best way to put it from the Ghostbusters movie. Um, they like moist shaded areas where they can hide. Uh, they like to hide from the birds and anything that's gonna go after them. Uh, and most of them can overwinter as eggs. So they can build up in some areas as well. Uh, so to control them, um, you take some raised beer that's, that hasn't, didn't quite do well, and you put it on a, 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 out in a little bowl or a little a, a shallow uh, container, and the, the, these guys will actually go towards that, and they will drown themselves in their sorrows. It's like a country and western song. Uh, and they'll actually drown in the beer. Uh, that's one way to control it. You can also use diatoms or diatomaceous earth that are very sharp, and you can put those around your plants and as these slugs or snails crawl over, the soft-bodied uh, uh, insects will actually cut them open and they will desiccate. Um, you can also use copper screening or other types of uh, screens that you can put around the plant or collars that you can make so you prevent these guys from actually getting to the plants. The one thing with the diametitious earth um, is, is that rain does a number on it. It's something yes. that you do have to reapply frequently. Right. If it rains, it will get wet and soggy and stop working. Um, I also, for, for my flower growing, I had a lot of success with Sluggo Plus, which is an organic slug bait. 
Um, I tried diamantitious earth first, didn't have a lot of luck with it, and then I tried the organic slug baits, and it actually, uh, my, my plants really did well after I started applying that. What did you use, Sluggo? Sluggo Plus. And it's, Logo it's Plus. A, it's, nice. It's an Omri rep- uh, approved. It's little pellets that's some kind of like iron something. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I've used something similar to that, and it works pretty well. Um, you know, one thing about that I observed over the years with working with the farms, not so much the gardens in this case, but we never really had problems with slugs until the advent of no till uh, planting came in. Yes. The as soon as that happened, then we started seeing problems with them because I guess the, uh, the amount of, you know, plant material that's left. Organic residue, yeah. That made protective covers for them and they survived better or the birds didn't find them or whatever. I don't know, but they became more of a problem in no-till. That's a good observation. Well, getting on to spider moves, we're going to cover a few more and we're about ready to, to, to wrap it up here in a few minutes. So let's cover spider mites and then... Next time we got some really cool things. Uh, uh, I know Bill Erickson and the rest of our group has got some interesting things to cover the next time around in part two. Um, that'll be after next week. Um, but spider mites, one way to control them, and this is the, the damage from spider mites. Um, I would actually see webbing from spider mites as well. And, and Bill's going to show you on some other plants where it causes webbing on a lot of ornamentals. We can also use uh, forceful water in the early stages, insecticidal soap will sometimes work. But even with these soaps and, and uh, different types of uh, summer or dormant oils, you've got to be very careful with those, especially that we're not overdoing it. So you really got to follow the label. Um, we can also use hot pepper sprays with capsaicin, uh, which if you catch it early enough, these things will work. Uh, but if these uh, spider mite has advanced to a critical stage, uh, many of these products are not necessarily going to be as effective. And I think that's the key for any disease or insect problem. Catch it in the early stages. Uh, so you want to go out there as a gardener or a landscaper and just keep an eye on your plants, take notes, uh, and catch things in the early stages. And that's what a good IPM practitioner will do. Anybody have any idea what's attacking these guys? Ray, this is a test for you. We'll get our senior guy in here looking at this. Huh. Colorado potato beetles. You got it, CPB. Yeah. Okay, so here's all the stages of Colorado potato beetle. And uh, when you guys see it um, eating like uh, you saw previously in that slide, you're in trouble. Uh, This is these egg masses on the underside of the leaves, and you see them. You want to crush all those egg masses. Uh, The immature stages on the right side there, they need to be destroyed because you see they're eating the leaves. On the adult that we have in the bottom there, uh, these guys are voracious feeders. Uh, they have problems with them all over the country. And as Ray will tell you, these guys are resistant to a lot of pesticides, and they can uh, easily develop resistance around almost everything that we've got out there. Uh, 20, 20, 20, 20, 30 years ago, here in New Jersey, I mean, that was our number one pest. I would say half the people in the extension service worked on Colorado potato beetles. And that was until Admire came along and a few other good control materials, but I remember one time touring a farm in Vineland, and the farmer was planting eggplants, and he had a planting machine that went across the field, planted the plants, and it took maybe 10 minutes to get to the other end of the field. By the time he turned around and came back, there were already potato beetles on the plants that he put in 10 to 15 minutes prior. That's how bad they were at that time. Yeah, but let's first talk about the control of Colorado potato beetle. Typically, we get two generations a year, uh, and as I said, they're resistant to many problems out there. So in a small garden situation, sometimes you get away with hand-picking them. Um, if you have mulch in an area it, where they've overwintered, sometimes in California, they used to just put down heavy mulch, and by the time they overwintering, the potato beetles climb through the mulch, they were out of energy. Um, but floating row cover uh, will work along with crop rotations in areas so that the beetle has to fly further to actually get to its host crop. And then BT, uh, specific strains of BT can actually work quite well in the immature stages. And different pyrethroids for gardeners can work. But you want to make sure that you read the label uh, and make sure that it's labeled exactly for what you're trying to control. Um, I'm sure you guys have some things to add on Colorado potato beetle because that's a big one. I'm uh, currently battling that in my own little garden. 
What I've been doing is squeezing those eggs on, on the other side of the leaves and uh, killing adults and then the larvae by hand. So I'm using the first first one there, hand picking as my control. Hey, Rich, we need to see where you are. So, yeah, I have firsthand experience working on this particular pest this year. So I've been trying to be able to keep it under control. Every three or four days I go out there and, and do some squashing of the uh, insect. So would you consider yourself a, a biological control? Uh, yes. Biological yeah, biological right. um, Mechanically, get mechanical control. That's amazing, Rich. Yet another thing to add to your resume. <laughs> Yeah, we, we would do similar. We would scout for the, the egg masses, and they're usually on the underside of the leaves, so they can be tricky to see sometimes. You sort yeah, of yeah. Develop, develop an intuition as to where they're going to be, and luckily they're orange. So we, adults and egg masses, we would scout and handpick, and then we had pretty good success with neem oil um, for oh, the yeah. house stage. When they're soft-bodied, it's more effective. But once they become adults and they have that shell, it's a little bit less effective, but to... Care yeah, bottom. neem oil has azadirectin in it, and it's it's isolated from the azadirectin indica tree, correct, from India, mm -hmm. and uh, that's been used successfully on insects and for some fungal diseases as well. Uh, but even with azadirectin, you want to be very careful with that because um, you don't want to overdo it, um, and you don't want residue left on your vegetables. So. The one thing that Ray mentioned earlier, I think, which is really important, just because something is organic or OMRI approved doesn't mean that you can just use it indiscriminately. You must use the label because organic pesticides can be as uh, challenging or as direct and harmful as any of the pesticides. So you have to make sure that you're following the label, following it exactly. And if you follow the label, uh, then you're going to be in a good range to be able to control the problem effectively. Um, and still be safe using that product. I think we're going to end it there. We're right at 8.04, so we're a little bit over. But I want to thank everybody, uh, especially my um, colleague, Ray Samulus, for coming back out of retirement again. This guy's incredible. You can't keep him down. He's just uh, he's amazing. Can we and, answer one quick question? Sure, for, go ahead. Uh, for Nancy, she she's been asking about her flea beetles do you, on on her potatoes, peppers, and eggplant. Um, okay. I'm sure there's a slide coming up, but but she's asked a couple times, and I'd like to get her an answer. You know what? Let me see if I get the flea beetle slide right next here. Hey, oh, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the best way to control flea beetle this is, should be the damage that she's seeing. So um, typically with flea beetles, you know they're little tiny guys and you know, 16th of an inch, uh, not big. So we use floating row covers, use hot pepper wax. Uh, some people use some, some different pyrethroid materials on them um, and they have pretty good uh, impact with them, but they can be very problematic and, and they, they can, uh, the population of these things can climb very quickly. And Bill, you know, as an organic grower uh, up in Maine, probably you had quite a few of these guys. You wanna talk about how you control them? Yeah, it was really using the, the floating row covers and crop rotation, especially for those um, crops like the arugula or mustard greens where you really couldn't tolerate damage. Um, and then just, you know, rotating and trying to improve crop health too. So for something like, like an eggplant, um, you know, if the plant is healthy enough, it can grow through a little bit of flea beetle damage, I think. And that's where you know, we talk about the thresholds where, you know, there might be a little bit of cosmetic damage to the leaves, but if the plant is healthy enough to support itself and grow through it, then it's not really going to reduce your yields or necessarily kill the plant. So covering them while they're young, especially in the seedling stage, and then when they get bigger, they will hopefully have had a, enough of a head start and they're healthy enough to survive some of that um, onslaught. And Bill has a really good point there that Sometimes younger, immature plants may not have enough leaves or photosynthetic area to be able to, to fend off or to survive through that onslaught of an insect or a disease attack, whereas a mature plant tends to have uh, greater resilience to be able to bounce back. And that's why a lot of times we recommend, you know, make sure you get a healthy plant when you go out and buy them. 
Look on the underside of leaves, as Bill was talking about. Make sure that it doesn't already have insect infestation when you buy it. Uh, make sure it's good and healthy, dark green. You're not taking diseases and, and planting them out into your vegetable garden. So these are all things that are extremely important if you want to start off healthy and keep those plants healthy. Uh, and with that, I, I want to thank Bill Erickson, my colleague in Monmouth County, who's the ag agent there. Um, uh, lucky to have you on with us, Bill. Uh, Glad to be here. My colleague, Rich Weidman, who's been working with me for 28 years, a uh, great person to work with, and Brandon Pearsall, who's just starting to work with us in extension and is a, is a great uh, person to work with. So we appreciate all of you being here tonight and sharing your knowledge. We hope you guys stay healthy. And we look forward to seeing you right back here again on Are You Ready to Garden? And please stay in touch with us and join us again next week, same time, same station. All right, take care, everybody. Thanks, guys. Take care. Good night, folks. Good night, everyone.